Hey, I actually know this one. Boddington's cans have those little carbonated capsules in them. Welcome to Wikipedia's Cool. Today's topic is Boddington's Brewery. Boddington's is a brewery in Manchester, England, which owned pubs throughout the Northwest of England. They're known best for their Boddington's Bitter, which are apparently called bodies. Why are the English always nicknaming things? Their beer is straw gold with a hoppy bitter taste and was one of the first beers packaged in cans containing a widget. That's what it's called, a widget, which gives it a creamy drought style head. Some of the best head I've ever had. In the 1990s, the beer was promoted as the cream of Manchester. Interesting choice for a promotion slogan, but it was popular with raising Manchester's reputation. It became one of their most popular products after Manchester United. That's a soccer slash football team, depending on what part of the world you're in. And Coronation Street, which at first I assumed was a literal street in Manchester, but turns out it's a soap opera. Oh, and it's still running. I was going to say it's like the British version of Days of Our Lives, which began in 1965, but it turns out Coronation Street began in 1960. So it's more like Days of Our Lives is the American version of Coronation Street. But we're here to talk about beer. In recent history, Whitbread bought Boddington's Brewery in 1989 which I have to say is one of the most English sounding words I've ever heard. Actually, now that I think about it, it's definitely because it sounds like white bread. And I mean, if white people were a food, that's definitely the food they would be. But because of the whip bread acquisition, Boddington's was able to receive increased marketing and larger distribution. Within eight years, it was being exported to 40 different countries. Boddington's beer is now owned by Anheuser-Busch. Woo! Wait, Anheuser-Busch is Belgian, Brazilian? Okay, so it was started in America, but it was acquired in 2008. The more you know. So yeah, Whitbread was acquired by Anheuser-Busch in 2000. So everyone's acquiring each other. But what's crazy is the story of how Boddington's came to be. It really encapsulates the butterfly effect and how everything that we know, no matter how big it gets, eventually turns to dust. If we rewind the clock back to 1778, two brothers, both named Thomas, founded a brewery called Strangeways. Hey, that's not Boddington's, you might say. And that's because Henry Boddington didn't join the brewery until over 50 years later in 1832. He wasn't even a beer guy. He joined as a traveling salesman. He was 21 years old. Do traveling salesmen even exist anymore? The last one I know of is Penn from Penn & Teller when he tries to sell that encyclopedia to Joey on Friends. Like most breweries at the time of Boddington's arrival, it was a modestly sized operation. But after 16 years at the company, he established himself as a partner of the brewery. By 1853, 21 years after joining, and after five years of being a partner, Henry Boddington borrowed money to become the sole owner of the brewery. So just to recap, this guy came into the company at the age of 21, and he was the sole owner by the age of 40. Over the next 24 years until 1877, the output of the brewery increased tenfold, going from roughly 10,000 barrels of beer to 100,000 per year which made it not only Manchester's largest brewery, but the largest brewery in North England, with contracts to purchase their beer from over 100 locations. So this guy's 64 at this point, and he eventually dies at 73 in 1886 with an estate worth 150,000 pounds. How much is that in today's money, you ask? 13.6 million pounds. How much is that in America money? 15.3 million America money. After Henry died, his son, William Slater Boddington, took the company public only two years after his father's passing. Quickly, for anyone who doesn't know, taking a company public means that normal people like you and me can buy and sell stock. It was estimated at this point that the brewery was worth about 320 million pounds, which is about 35 million America money. And if you want to look up William Slater Boddington on the internet, make sure you include the Slater. Apparently, William Westcott Boddington is the more famous of the two because he was an Olympian in the 1930s. That's the Olympics with Hitler and Jesse Owens. And by the way, quick side note, if you're someone who wants to become rich in the quickest amount of time possible, being born to a father with an established nationwide business is one of the best ways to do it. So by this point, 1888, 110 years after the creation of the brewery, it finally becomes known as Boddington's Brewery. And I love how Wikipedia will just throw you complete curveballs because the next part of the article is like, Boddington's was one of the breweries implicated in the 1900 English beer poisoning epidemic, in which 6,000 people were poisoned by arsenic and 70 died. And then literally the line after that is like, in January 1902, 86% of production was of mild ale. We're just gonna fly right over that. This is how you end up going down Wikipedia rabbit holes, because if you wanna learn more about the beer poisoning epidemic, you can look up 1900 English beer poisoning to find the article. The Boddington family held as much as 40% of the company by the 1930s, passing the company down from son to son. The brewery was hit by bombs in World War II and destroyed a bunch of the water tanks used for production. So when it was rebuilt, the equipment was updated, and they became the first brewery in Europe to use stainless steel vats, which is what you'll see in pretty much any modern brewery today. This is about that time that famous beer widget I mentioned earlier started getting popular. In the 1950s, their pale ale, 
also called a bitter, started overtaking the mild ale in sales. And guess who made their first appearance in 1961? Whitbread! Now this is the point where acquisitions and mergers start. Ooh, mergers and acquisitions, better not put that in a YouTube video. It's actually quite interesting. At this point, it's 1969, and Charles Boddington, the great-grandson of our original Henry Boddington, is running the brewery. A company called Allied Brewery straight up tried to buy Boddington's, which was then valued about 5 million pounds, or 70 million American money today. Instead of selling the company for a huge cash out, Charles took the unusual step of defending the company's shareholders, which again, if you're not into finances, people like you and me can be shareholders by purchasing or selling stock, which are like little pieces of ownership of the company. In his letters to his shareholders, Charles said things like, There is an inexorable progression towards the mass-produced nationwide product of standardized quality. And the takeover will do nothing for the national economy add nothing to the nation's exports, and contribute nothing at all to the quality of life that we are all used to enjoy. If that doesn't make sense, he's basically saying if we sell this company, all the control is going to be under one party, Allied Breweries, who will definitely lower the quality of Boddington's beer and start mass producing it like every other beer that they have. Now, if you're an American, who does that sound like? Who does that sound like? Mass-produced, nationwide product of standardized quality. Budweiser. Budweiser, and every other domestic American beer company. Now, something I've withheld thus far in the video is that I'm actually quite the beer nerd. I've been into craft beer for about a decade, and it was actually my job in Texas during the pandemic. What Charles is talking about here is a real problem that is still present in the beer industry today. In 2019, my favorite craft brewery, Dogfish Head, was ironically purchased by one of the first craft breweries, the Boston Beer Company, for 300 million America money. The owner did retain creative rights, but what's going to happen when he's gone? Pilsner Urkel, the original Pilsner beer, which is responsible for two-thirds of the world's beer today, was purchased in 1999, and then again by Anheuser-Busch, and then most recently in 2017 by Asahi. By Asahi. Asahi, the Japanese beer company. Why do you think America has a reputation for bad beer? It's because of these guys. And while in some cases the owners might retain rights, that's not a permanent solution. And if you're the person who's been enjoying these beers for several years, there's a real fear for you, the consumer, that these beers will see a drop in quality at some point in the future. That's the issue that Charles Boddington, great-grandson of Henry Boddington, is concerned with here. So as a result of Charles's letter, Whitbread actually increased their stake in the company, and the Boddington family as well as shareholders refused to sell their portions. Also, I just realized I've been referring to Whitbread as he? They're actually a company. It's the company that has a stake in Boddington's, not an individual. However, supposedly the chairman of Whitbread was named Colonel Whitbread. That's not a joke, and I couldn't find a picture of him, so... Colonel Whitbread reportedly said, You are very old. You have a very good name. You mustn't go out. At the time, it was rare for a company to win an emotional argument for their independence. It was the first time that a regional brewery had fended off a national company. I don't know why the article says at the time. It's like, when do companies ever win emotional arguments today? Like in my lifetime, I've never seen a company driven by anything other than profit. I mean, if you've ever met a small business owner, you know their brain mostly operates in dollars or whatever your country's currency is. In 1970, Charles Boddington retired and his son Ewart assumed directorship. I don't know if it's Ewart or Ewart, but I'm going to stick with uh, Ewart. I also didn't know the word directorship was a word until I read this article. But that's one of the reasons why I started this channel, to educate myself. Not for you guys, because this is only the third video and there is no you guys. And hopefully I'm still making videos. So a year later in 1971, Allied Brewery sold their share, leaving Whitbread with 25%, the Boddington family with 10%, and the rest divided among the shareholders, which is actually pretty cool, because that's like 75% held by the people. But also kind of not cool, because that's pretty much why we have this profit-driven capitalist model that's ruining the experience for customers today. That's like pretty much all of us. And again, if you don't know much about economics, the consumer is you. You consume stuff. And trying to keep the shareholders happy is why video game and movie companies will often push content out too early. If we don't push this movie or this video game out quickly enough, our company will lose money for this year, our stock will go down, our shareholders will be upset and sell their stock, our company will lose even more money, creating a snowball effect. That's basically a summary of what corporations are worried about. Boddington's, however, continued to grow throughout the 70s thanks to the Boddington's bitter. In 1981, the Observer said, What has stood Boddington's in good stead is the highly distinctive flavor of its brews, especially its bitters. In fact, in the Northwest, 
bodies is increasingly becoming a sort of cult brew. I'm running out of voices. I don't know. I'm not a guy who knows how to do voices. I'm just making one up for every time I quote something. And then in 1982, Boddington's actually bought Oldham Brewery. Old Ham Brewery. At which point they own 272 public houses. Oh my god, I had no idea that's what pub stands for. Public house. Wow. And in 1985, they paid over 27 million pounds to take over the Higgins Brewery in Liverpool. Which, at this point, I'm starting to wonder at what point something becomes a monopoly. And... There's a lot of content for this video. Again, it's only video number three, so... If anybody wants a part two, just let me know. I don't feel like anyone's gonna care at this point because it's too early in the channel. <laughs> it's too early in the channel. I'm gonna make a new video about mermaids. And then maybe the algorithm will pick me up. But if you are one of the lucky early subscribers, that means I'll respond to you in the comments section. What do you wanna know? No sponsors to plug here. All right, that's it, see you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed it, see you later.